Okay, I've got the signal and we can begin. So today is uh, the second appearance by Dominic Levin, and the topic is the Ukrainian crisis in the comparative historical context of the end of empires and their consequences. And Dominic will speak for a short time just to get our brains moving, and then it's an open discussion. Chai. Thanks so much, Ron. Y yes, I mean, I've given my lecture, so, you know, the fellows have seen it. Uh, I won't talk now for more than five minutes. This is your session, not mine, for questions. <coughs> All I would say at the beginning is, I hope, three points. Firstly, that whether or not you like the comparison of the Soviet Union with other great imperial polities, it seems to me that that comparison is probably most useful of all when it comes to looking at the consequences of the collapse of empire and of the Soviet Union in the context of the collapse of empire. Point one. Point two, uh, the collapse of empire is almost always associated with enormous instability, conflict, war. That is partly because empires are by definition great powers. The disappearance or diminution of a great power causes ripples throughout the international system. Great insecurity, ambitions, resentments, loss of status, you name it. On top of that, empires are by definition multi-ethnic communities with all the various peoples to a greater or lesser extent intermingled. Trying to disentangle that into ethno-national states with fixed borders is a recipe for immense conflict. Thirdly, um, I would say, well, the next point, is that so long as they are living in an empire, whether it is uh, one of the great dynastic empires of history or to some extent even in an empire where sovereignty essentially lies with the Marxist-Leninist party elite, ethno-national identity is of secondary importance. Once you are dealing with the post-imperial situation in which states are sovereign, national, and in a sense belonging to a particular nationality, then the whole business of defining who the people are and who the people are not becomes extremely fraught. And the last point is simply to say that disentangling land empires is harder than disentangling transoceanic empires, especially actually for the metropolitan people. That, for very obvious reasons, the distinction between metropole and periphery is less clear in a land empire, usually. Uh, less clear both geographically and in terms of identity, very often. And, of course, in the post-imperial conflicts, the former metropolitan power, with all its resentments, loss of status, etc., is right in the middle of things. The final point I make is simply to you know, go back to the 1890s, when the chief legal advisor of the Russian Imperial Foreign Office, Theodore Martins, wrote his great tome. He recognized that the national principle to every people defined by ethnicity, culture, history, language, there should be a state, was becoming increasingly the dominant source of legitimacy in international discourse. He said that if that principle ever triumphed in the enormous region, uh, then ruled by the Romanovs, the Habsburgs, the Hohenzollerns, and the Ottomans, there would be chaos uh, and enormous bloodshed. And he was right. It's taken two world wars, genocide in the fullest meaning of the word, ethnic cleansing on a titanic scale, to turn the map of East Central Europe into the map of more or less nation states from what it was in his era, the map of empire. The business isn't over even in Europe, especially if you think of the Soviet Union as the last great uh, empire in Europe. And of course, it isn't over in the Middle East, where we are still, to some extent, fighting wars and conflicts of post-Ottoman succession. And the final point to make is simply that most of the great states of Asia, whether you're talking about Iran or Indonesia or India, or even to some extent China, are not empires, but they are closer to being empires than they are to the model European ethno-national state. 
Uh, and if the, the principle of, let us say, Tamil Nadu for the Tamils triumphs uh, across Asia, uh, then the consequences will be simply catastrophic for the planet. So I shut up. That's the context in which I see uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union and its aftermath. Let me begin with a question, because I don't see hands yet, but you can do that thing with your, your signs, if you like. Uh, so Slava Marozov, in his lecture, said, but kind of fleetingly, that he thought the conflict in Ukraine was more about nationalism than it was about imperialism. And I've been pondering that and trying to figure out what he meant because he didn't go into it very much. So there's a general uh, conventional, almost dominant view in some places like in the United States that the, there are claims that you know Putin wants to re rebuild the Soviet Union or that this is an imperial uh, effort to incorporate Ukraine into, into some kind of a subordinate role within an imperial kind of subordinate role with Russia, etc., or that it's actually a, a conflict between two still forming nation states in some sense, and therefore this is about their own self definition and and identity, and and this clash over now it's largely limited to East, Eastern Ukraine is precisely a national rather than an imperial struggle. Do you have a way that we can get closer to that answer if I haven't misrepresented? Do you want me to answer that? Well, I won't answer it because I don't think there is a, a clear answer to that. But, but it seems to me it's both. Um, undoubtedly, it is you know, an attempt to define two nations out of what was an imperial space. Um, and both of them are struggling. After all, if one looks at the Donbass, you know, I've constantly been badgered, but actually right back to 14 and before, as to whether the Donbass is Russian or is Ukrainian. I got out of this in Russia, Russian by sneaking off and saying it belonged to my great granddad, but that was a sort of cop out. I should have actually been more courageous and said that historically, if anything, it belongs more to Russia, but legally it belongs to Ukraine. I mean, the truth of the matter, it seems to me, is that in the 1990s, if you polled much of the population of the Donbass, they would not have defined themselves as either Ukrainian or Russian in the ethno-linguistic historical terms of the model. Probably their strongest identity in many cases was a regional and above all a mining one. Mining communities have a very powerful sense of identity. Um, you know, the region was a very distinct region. Was it Russian or Ukraine? Well, it was a sort of borderland region. And actually, you could take that right the way down the border until almost you run into Habsburg Galicia. You know, if you go back in time, and actually there are, by all accounts, I haven't been there, sort of strong elements of this. Sense. The local population, peasant population, speaks a sort of local regional dialect, which is a strange mixture of Russian, Ukrainian, and something no one can quite understand. Utterly incomprehensible on the streets of Kiev or Moscow, let alone to squeaky Levin. So again, you know, you've got all, it's, uh, this isn't that unfamiliar. You know, um, one's seen these kind of things before when empires collapse in borderlands and things like this. At the same time, I don't think you can completely take away the idea this is an imperial struggle. When, of course, I'm talking about empire, it does not always have the horrid, wicked connotations, which it seems to inevitably have in, you know, Western discourse. Empires had their benefits, one of which was avoiding precisely these kind of inter- you know, ethnic wars. But I think it is true that from the perspective of the leadership in Moscow, and actually they are an exaggerated version of what I have been used to in time in London, perfectly obviously part of their identity, part of the whole point of being an imperial elite, is that you feel you have a role in history, you, you matter. Um, and just as Izvolsky and Sazonov, I, mean, I think I quoted Izvolsky, this is Nicholas II's foreign minister, just before, well, 1906 to 1910. Um, he, he once wrote to Sazonov, you know, we have two alternatives. Either we become second, you know, secure, but very much second lieutenant to Germany, which will dominate Europe. Or we strike up with the English and the French to d defend our position as a great imperial power. 
uh, we must do the latter because to do the former is to cease to be Russia, the Russia of Peter and Catherine, the Russia of our ancestors. Well, you know, Putin and co. don't have ancestors like Izvolsky. Um, but nevertheless, they do metaphorically think of themselves as absolutely belonging to a great country which matters greatly in the world, which is respected, which will have a strong say in the future of mankind. And, and this is, if you like, to put it nastily, a matter of status, but status was always absolutely part of empire. Um, and that is before you begin getting down to the nitty gritty, that obviously, for example, you know, uh, an elite which was, uh, when, we, when it was young and when it began its careers, uh, dominated all Europe down to Berlin, is now, you know, deeply at risk of losing hegemony over the Black Sea, which Russia has held since Catherine's day. So there are both you know, sentimental, emotional, psychological factors involved uh, and deeply material ones. But, you know, <laughs> complex, complexity of the business is, it isn't just that. It is also two nations trying to define who they are. And I think that the great majority of Russians actually, certainly when this conflict began, would have felt in their hearts that the Donbass and certainly Crimea were Russian. Uh, and of course, uh, vast numbers of Russians, uh, Ukrainians would have thought the opposite. So, I mean, it's not an easy one.